In the name of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. You may have heard this Genesis reading before. It's part of a big story about big things, the very beginning of things, and it has a really big reputation. It may be the most famous and infamous story in the Bible. Indeed, it's so well known. So much has been said about it for better and sadly for a lot of worse that it can be hard to hear the story beneath all the layers of interpretation. It can be hard for some of us to hear it at all. As I discovered or recalled when I used this story to open a cathedral women's retreat a few years ago, and it was less than warmly received. Some of you may have been there and remember that that's actually putting it mildly. There was an open revolt. And I had forgotten. I had forgotten what a stumbling block it can be, what a stumbling block it had been for me, because I'd wrestled with it over the years and come to love it. Yes, I love this story. I love its poetry and imagery, its earthiness and humanity. And I love it because it's true. True. Not in the sense that it's a scientifically verifiable or historically accurate account of the beginning of the world or of sin or of the snake's leglessness. No, it's true in the way that good poetry, good literature, a good story is true. It shows me something I recognize and, admittedly, resemble. The story, of course, begins before our reading does. It begins at the beginning when God fashioned a man, human being from the earth, and plopped him down in the middle of a garden in Eden and provided everything he needed and gave him a great responsibility to till and keep the garden. God gave him freedom too, freedom with limits and guidance. You are free, God told this human, to eat of every tree in the garden, except for one, the tree of knowledge, good and evil, which only makes that the most desirable tree in the garden. Then God fashioned a companion, and they became man and woman, and were naked and not ashamed. Until this serpent reminded the woman of that tree and awakened her desire to be wise, to explore, to open her eyes and know and grow. And scripture says, the woman saw it, took of its fruit and ate, and she also gave some to her husband who was with her, and he ate. That's it, period, the end. That whole momentous decision, that action that has come to be known as the fall, narrated in one swift line. Because the narrative emphasis, the emphasis is on what happens afterwards. When the Lord comes walking through the garden in the cool of the day and they hide. So God calls out, where are you? Adam dances all around a direct answer. Well, I heard you and I was afraid for I was naked and I hid. So God tries again, asking as directly as possible, have you eaten from the tree I told you not to? But Adam hides again. The woman you gave me, she gave me the fruit, and I ate it. With Adam abdicating responsibility, God turns to the woman next. Maybe she'll be braver. Maybe she's the grown-up here. So God asks her, 
What is this you have done? But she too passes the buck. The serpent? The serpent tricked me and I ate. God is giving them a chance. God is giving them a choice to stand up and respond. Here I am. Yes, I did it. It was me. I'm sorry. Now what? But they don't. They don't. Afraid of the consequences of their actions, afraid of their freedom to choose and their power to do right or wrong. Afraid of God. Afraid of disappointing God, being rejected by God. They choose blame instead. The story continues, of course. There are consequences, big ones. Things will be different now. And there's mercy, too, and new life. God sews fig leaf clothing for them, and the woman, that woman who has been blamed for so much through history, she is named Eve, the mother of the living. The story continues today, too. That's how we know it's true. We're still pointing fingers everywhere we can. It's their fault. Children are still arguing, he hit me, she hit me first, as if that justified everything that follows. Adults are equally good at the blame game, aren't we? Maybe even better. At least, this one is. So many arguments with my husband. Yes, we argue from time to time. So many of my arguments with him disintegrate into this familiar search for the original offense. Well, you started it. I'm just reacting to what you did or how you said it. As if his actions inevitably determined my own, as if admitting that maybe, just maybe, I might have been wrong myself would undo me or undo us. And that's the real fear, after all. But I don't think my family's alone. Everywhere I turn, everywhere I turn, it seems that people are offloading responsibility like a hot potato onto partners, parents, colleagues, upbringing, circumstances, genes, institutions, leaders. Leaders are a time-honored target for blame. The blame game is writ large in so many of the national and global conflicts too, with each side focusing on what the other has done wrong or is doing wrong, rather than on what they themselves can do right. Rabbi Edwin Friedman calls this blame displacement, blame displacement, which he defines as Casting blame outward rather than taking responsibility for one's own condition. It is, he says, a flight from challenge and a distraction from one's own responsibility, one's own ability to respond. And he says, it's an indication of, you've got to love this, societal regression or the lowering of maturity. In the midst of fear or anxiety or tragic, inexplicable loss, blame gives a sense of control. If we can isolate the problem and pin it on someone or something, then we have an easy, quick fix. Get rid of that someone or something and everything will be fine with little cost to ourselves. But that control, that simplistic conception of life is an illusion. It's an illusion. What blame displacement really fosters is helplessness, 
and hopelessness in the face of circumstances or of other people's actions. What's more, a blame culture suffocates the kind of self-awareness, honest dialogue, and emotional and spiritual maturity that can lead to transformation and reconciliation. It stifles leadership. It stifles leadership and the kind of brave risk-taking that leads to discovery and growth. The very kind of risk-taking, my friends, that we see, ironically, in Eve. The story that Genesis tells is not this story of helpless determinism, and it's not about blaming Adam and Eve or the serpent for all our sins or for everything that we think is wrong in the world. Rather, the story is about us. It's a call to us, to you and to me. It's a call into the awesome freedom that God has given us and into the responsibility that goes with it. Another rabbi, Jonathan Sachs says, the only antidote to fear is responsibility. The only antidote to fear, he says, is responsibility. The refusal to believe that there is nothing we can do. The decision never to take refuge in blaming others, making them scapegoats for our frustrations and fears. Courage, he continues. Courage is born the moment we decide not to complain, but instead to make a personal protest against the evils of the world by doing good. By doing good, however slight. Yes, we know that responsibility takes courage and it builds courage. The fact is, when we say yes to the responsibility God gives us, when we risk standing up and saying, here I am, when we risk speaking and acting and deciding for good, we will get it wrong sometimes. We'll misstep in some small and some really big ways. We will offend. We will incur guilt, and there will be consequences because... Because what we do matters. What we do matters a lot. And this mattering, this responsibility is a heavy burden. It's a really heavy burden if we believe it's all up to us and only us. Especially given what a mess most of us really are. And that brings us back full circle to God to come out of hiding, to come out of hiding, we have to trust God and God's guidance and God's mercy, God's merciful guidance. Yes, we trust in God who comes looking for us too. And when we're hiding from the problems we see or the pain we feel or the responsibility we have, we trust when God comes looking and asks us, not in condemnation, but in love. Not in condemnation, but in love. Where are you? Where are you? Amen.